Let me fire this up for you. Having been in the business for over 35 years, there's always a defining moment. This is one of those moments when you get a chance to buy, sell one of the greatest cars to ever run at Le Mans. Not only was it a great car from the fact that it was the pole sitter, the fact that it was one of 11 Mark II's, nine remaining, and one of the few cars that was actually a Shelby car, as well as a Hallman Moody car, and one of the two full out Mark II Bs with all of the updates. That's only part of the story. The history of this car really starts at Le Mans in 66, even though it's in its 67 Le Mans livery. In 66, it was a red car. Gurney and Grant were driving the car. It was the fastest lap, fastest top speed that had ever been accomplished at Le Mans. It was crazy what Ford had spent to beat Ferrari. And then you had the famous start of the race where all the cars are getting together. Miles is one car. This car gets off a little bit late. Miles gets hit by another car, and it's the start to what everybody knows now from Ford versus Ferrari, probably the best Le Mans race ever. Once Shelby realized he needed a bigger engine to really compete at Le Mans, they started with GT106 and GT107 and did the prototype Mark IIs. Basically, it was a 427 stuffed into a Mark I chassis that was really designed for a 289. It was a lot of horsepower that had to go not only through the transaxle, but also through the chassis. It was reinforced all over the place. Eventually, they came up with a transaxle that would live. So by 1966, they had developed a fairly bulletproof car. You remember, they put these engines on the chassis dynos. They ran them for 36 hours instead of 24 hours. They ran it through the gears up and down. Ford spared no expense in making sure they were going to win Le Mans. Not only did they win, they finished first, second, and third. And this car here arguably would have won overall had it not blown a head gasket in hour number 17. It was the fastest car all week. It was the pole sitter. It led most of the race. It wasn't until it blew a head gasket that it was retired. After it retired from the 66 Le Mans race, they got it ready for Daytona in 67. This time it was AJ Foyt and Dan Gurney behind the wheel. The same combination that ended up winning Le Mans in 67. Well at Daytona, they put it on the pole again. Fastest car in the field. Unfortunately again, it had some issues during the race. So for 67 in Appendix J in the rule book, they decided they had to make some changes, coming up with the J car, later the Mark IV. But because that car was still unproven, and because literally there was a failure that involved the death of Ken Miles, they weren't sure if they should send just J cars or that they should send a couple of updated Mark II Bs. What happened was, is this car left Shelby's hands, went to Hallman Moody, and only two cars got the full-on Mark II B experience. 1047 this one, and 1031. There's a significant amount of differences between a Mark II and a Mark II B. So one of the things that they found is the drivers weren't particularly comfortable in the cars. So the Mark II Bs, the layout is very different. The entire dash is different, where all the toggles are, where everything is, the seat is very much different. Far more comfortable than a Mark I or even a Mark II. A very comfortable car to drive, a lot of the Mark II B updates were also on the J car. When I sit in this car compared to a Mark I or the other Mark IIs, you're sitting a little bit lower. It feels like a real race seat. Of course, one of the highlights of most of these cars is the Gurney bubble. Dan Gurney was a tall guy. His helmet kept bouncing off the roof. They actually decided they had to cut a hole in the top of the door and add this bubble. Now, a lot of cars ended up with the Gurney bubble, but it was really because of Dan and his height that they had to build this into the cars. So some of the big differences were they had the silicone side windows, they had a flip up nose for easier access. Of course, the interior was different. And then the plexiglass carburetor induction system. Really cool the way they designed it. Really slick how when you open it up, it just sort of comes apart in a clamshell and then fits nice and tight. Of course, the engine in these cars was a dry deck, tunnel port, dry sump. I mean, you think of that technology on a big old 427, the oil pan and the timing chain cover on this thing is just super unique, really cool looking. By the time they had the bundle of snakes back here, that whole plexiglass with the giant hollies underneath it, 
it was a full, full engine compartment back here. So although there were only two full on Mark II Bs, this one has a bunch of really unique features standalone just to this car. The flip front end, which made it easier to access the front. The fact that they did that though, eliminated the spare tire from the front. They ended up putting that in the back. The silicone hinged window on the side here, which was a little bit different. Again, you can look at the back here and you can see where they put the spare. It almost looks funky because you've got three wheels in the back. Of course, you have the luggage box, which was part of the Le Mans rules. You had to have a certain size box to put your luggage in. Interesting rule. So one of the other cool features is not only did they have the regular lights so you could see the numbers you know, through the night, but the actual entire side number lit up. It was really cool. They had wiring going to it. They rivet on that panel. They made it waterproof. And at night, it just illuminates. They thought of literally everything. They had to win this race. Really cool part of this is obviously the engine. You think about it, this was by far the most sophisticated race car anybody had built until this point in history. And if you have a look at it, it really is a full on race car, even by today's standards. You look at the sway bars, you know, they've got arms like a, a modern NASCAR has today. It's a different size, obviously, but the same technology. So much of this car was built specifically to last for the 24 hours. They didn't rev these motors to 9,000 RPM. They didn't even rev them to 7,000 RPM. The idea was to use as little RPM as possible, make the motor live as long as possible, put as much oil into the dry sump as possible to help cool it, to help lubricate it. And also if it used up some oil, you wouldn't run out of oil and hurt the motor. They made it super efficient so you could fill the oil up without even having to lift the back up. And again, if you look at the headers, they're a work of art. The bundle of snakes, one of the calling cards to a GT40 is just beautiful. Then you look at all the coolers, but again, this plexiglass air induction system was only on this car and the J cars or the Mark IVs. This was the only Mark IIB to get this and it was fairly complicated. You can see how much forming would be involved, how the air would come in, how they had a special little plenums here to keep the air moving fast because the velocity is a big deal. If you look at the half shafts, it looks almost like a modern heavy duty CV joint, which again was unheard of back at the time. Brakes, suspension, handling, weight, super lightweight body. When you open the doors on this car, it just feels super light. So much of how these cars were built were really stolen from the aircraft industry. You can see all the Lexan or side glass has that flush fit like you would have on aircraft. You can see how everything's riveted and it's all riveted flush like you would on an aircraft. Even the coolers are stolen out of a Cessna. The fact that Shelby was at an airport, it was very easy for him to go next door, get an airplane mechanic to work on these cars and get ideas from the aircraft industry. But one of the best parts of any GT40 is how it sounds. Let me fire this up for you. I'm not gonna be able to drive it around the street here. I mean, it is a full on race car, but I was lucky enough years ago, I got to drive the Ken Miles car, the 66 second place finisher, arguably sometimes the first place finisher. I got to drive that around Watkins Glen and that was one of the highlights of my car career. Because there were only two really full-on Mark II Bs, not to mention it was the one that had so many different unique options that were also shared by the J car, 
That's why it got restored to 67 livery instead of 66 livery. Although it didn't finish again, it has a really unique place in GT40 history. Two poles, great drivers, fast lap, arguably one of the fastest GT40s they ever built, really is only one Mark IIb outfitted this way and it would be a shame to pull all that off. The history is still the same and it gives us a glimpse into how unique this Mark IIb is.